So here's a tip for everyone on the line. When you're called upon to do the intro with a speaker as, as uh, let's say, distinguished as Alex, what you, what you always should say is the speaker needs no introduction and uh, have them run from there. So, so Alex, is, and that's a little tongue in cheek, but it's also true. I mean, so Alex has done a lot of great work in, in numerical analysis and scientific computing. I've been interacting with him on a couple of things. As a lot of you know, we have done work on randomized linear algebra. There's a lot of interesting connections with theoretical computer science and randomized uh, and, 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 and um, you know, numerical linear algebra on various matrix problems. And Alex is sort of working on some of these things and has done a lot of sort of um, recent stuff on uh, sort of scientific machine learning that I guess he's gonna talk about today. And um, I think sort of under the hood, there's a lot of interesting things here from the ML perspective, but also the algorithmic perspective. Um, so I've talked to you about different things, Alex, but not this in particular. So I'm looking forward to this. And you didn't come here to hear me, you came here to hear Alex. So with that uh, introduction, let me pass the baton on to Alex and thanks for being here, Alex. Okay, yeah, thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation. Um, so the questions I'm going to be thinking about today is, uh, can one learn a differential operator from pairs of solutions and right-hand sides? And if you can, then uh, how many pairs are required if you say, I want an accuracy of to within epsilon, what does that even mean? And then how many pairs of solutions and right-hand sides might I need to deliver an accuracy of epsilon? Um, so these two questions are just generally PDE learning has received a lot of uh, research attention recently. And uh, I guess the hope is from data, one can eventually learn physical laws or uh, laws of nature or conservation laws um, that, you, that you, we haven't yet got from um, mechanistic thinking. And so while the literature contains many highly successful practical schemes uh, based on deep learning, uh, the, the challenge still remains exactly how to understand when and why these deep learning techniques are so efficient and effective uh, theoretically. And today I'm going to give a, let's say, a reasonably theoretical uh, take on PD learning um, and see what we can get. I'm, in particular, I'm going to derive a learning rate for uh, learning in Green's functions. Uh, this is joint work with Nicholas Boulle, who's a graduate student at the University of Oxford. He's uh, on the job market right now. And uh, together with collaborators, uh, Chris Earls and Eugene Nakazukasa. So back to the question, can one learn an unknown, let's say, linear PDE from input and output data? Let's, let's keep the question as simple as possible. And let's make the PDE linear. So the idea is you're given forcing terms on the right hand side of your PDE and you're given the solution u as well, so these pairs, and you want to uh, uncover uh, the P something about the PDE operator that's mapping you from the solutions to the right-hand sides. In particular, if you want a map that goes from the right-hand sides to the solutions, then you're interested in somehow like the solution operator. And so uh, in this talk, I'm gonna be imagining that you've been given either by simulation, so you've proposed right-hand sides and watched and uh, calculated the solutions. So you have a black box for a P your PDE solver, or maybe you're in an experiment and you get to force the, ex the experiment your own particular way and watch its response. Then from those pairs of forcing terms and systems response, I'm gonna try to uh, uncover things about the underlying PDE operator that governs the map between U's and F's with some boundary conditions. Okay, so um, I'm gonna be, uh, in theory, I'm gonna be focusing mainly on salva joint second order elliptic PDEs with Dirichlet boundary conditions. That's just to make sure everything I say is definitive, but uh, these results can extend to uh, parabolic PDEs as well. Uh, of course, there's uh, lots of methods out there already, uh, particular that use deep, deep learning to do this. Uh, for example, uh, Brunton and Kutz uh, have a lot of methods around CINDY, a sparse identification of nonlinear dynamics. And so their idea is from trajectory data watching dynamical systems, they try to fit uh, a linear combination of a nonlinear dictionary. Um, there's also um, Karadakis and co-authors co around PINs, this physical physics informed neural network 
where they have a neural network based way of uh, discretizing PDs, which is uh, simple to implement and quite effective. Uh, there's also Lexing Ying and collaborators where they do partial um, differential operator learning. And that's they use very particular specialized neural nets based on wavelet transforms. And uh, Wayne and E and others who look at more high dimensional versions of this. So there's, there's tons of practical work. And the classical development of neural nets has primarily been focused on learning the maps between finite spaces. So they would discretize their inputs and outputs. But more recently, uh, people have been uh, doing operator neural networks where instead of just learning a, a discretized version of that solution operator, they try to go for the operator itself. And so when you try to do this, one thing to notice is that the PDE operator, if I'm thinking about second order elliptic PDE, is uh, an unbounded operator. And so it becomes very tricky to understand the functional analysis of that in terms of if I'm trying to make the learning rate precise, it's very hard to make that precise when you when the underlying operator you're learning is unbounded. If you if you go straight for the partial differential operator L, and so instead people try to go for the solution operator, which you can think of as the right inverse of the PDE operator. Um, <clears throat> so uh, you're given these inputs, and instead of trying to learn the operator itself, you're trying to learn the map the operator between from the um, forcing terms f's to the solutions u uh, instead of learning the pd operator itself which is a map from the solutions to the forcing terms so you kind of invert that and most people will do some kind of uh, version of learning and training a neural network to learn the operator which is the right inverse of the pde and then it, Alex, Alex, is this is this the right inverse or this is like the right in it's a right inverse a restricted right. to the discrete um the discretization you have yeah yeah there's a it's a it's a right it's a right inverse but here i'm thinking at the continuous level but of course things end up getting discretized um in practice but in terms of what we're aiming for let's say like psychologically we're trying to get the continuous uh, a continuous right inverse, which is also called the solution operator. And then this is really nice if you have the solution operator because you can quickly solve PD, the PD. Right? That's, that's, what, that's just the evaluation of the neural net that you've trained. And so uh, I like that there's at least three main approaches here that kind of have uh, connections to traditional methods. Um, so like Fourier neural operator, that's uh, kind of mo motivated from Fourier spectral methods. Deep O net is, uh, in some sense, motivated from collocation methods. And there's deep green, which is uh, motivated from boundary integral methods where you have a greens function. And they're all just uh, different details that, that, are, that do matter, but different details uh, of uh, trying to tackle this problem. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So the, the main challenges are in, in trying to understand this solution operator are always uh, depending on the quality of your training data that you've been given, trying to provide some performance guarantees, which is extremely hard if you're in a deep learning setting. Um, <clears throat> uh, what kind of neuro, uh, neural network architectures do you need? All the ones I've mentioned, they have slightly different neural uh, network architectures that in their own way are motivated from traditional methods. Of course, it has to be robust to noise, which can be challenging if you want the, uh, the final result to be interpretable, then it's important that whatever you're doing is robust to small perturbations in the inputs or outputs. And uh, th so this is once you get the model right, uh, one thing we would like to do is actually interpret it, like find out what the dominant eigenfunctions of the PDE operator are, or the symmetries that it has, or the conservation laws, or if there are any singularities uh, that might form in solutions. And so these are what people are trying to do and trying to understand this. And I'm going to come at this from a theoretical aspect uh, now. So to get some theory into the game, I'm going to always be learning something that has a very classical mathematical meaning known as the Green's function. So associated to um, all uniformly elliptic PDEs uh, with 
bounded coefficients is a, a Green's function. And <clears throat> this is a integral operator, which is a map between, is a solution operator. It maps right-hand sides, Fs, to solutions, and uh, can be thought of as an in the inverse of that PDE operator. For uniformly elliptic PDEs in one, two, and three dimensions, the integral operator here is uh, Hilbert-Smith. It's a Hilbert-Smith integral operator where this, there is a known Green's function, this G, that's square integral. So in some sense, this is a nice uh, compact operator, linear operator, and um, from which we can do theory for. In particular, we can look at what's the learning rate for learning G. So that this idea, uh, well, this idea of learning Green's functions, uh, I learned from uh, Lex and Ying's work, uh, which was published in 2019. Um, so instead of uh, learning, let's say, the Laplacian, if I'm learning Poisson, I'm going to be trying to learn the corresponding Green's function, which in this case, for this simple PDE, is, uh, looks like this in 1D. Or for Helmholtz, if I was going to learn Helmholtz, I wouldn't be wanting to learn the Helmholtz wave frequency k. I would go for the Green's function here, which is the kernel that sits inside this integral operator. <clears throat> so we're kind of not doing PDE learning, but Green's function learning, if you, if you like it that way. And uh, then at the end, I, I will look at you know, what can you glean. Once you have the Green's function, what can you actually discover from it? So I'm going to show you that there's um, a, a definitive learning rate uh, for learning Green's functions. And uh, in particular, I'm going to uh, describe a randomized algorithm that uh, provably learns the Green's function to within a particular accuracy uh, close to epsilon. There are some parameters here which are measures of the quality of the training data that you've been given. And uh, anyway, this is a way of making uh, one, one way to make some aspects of PDE learning precise. OK, and uh, uh, coming soon, there's a, we're going to remove that epsilon to the minus 6, which is an annoying feature here, which if we do remove that, and we, then it will be saying almost there's a spectral method for PDE learning or for Green's function learning, because this, this, the number of input-output pairs that you need only depends on log 1 over epsilon, which is a, kind of a nice result uh, in terms of uh, the learning rate is, is very good. OK, so now I'm going to uh, get into uh, the types of techniques that you need to put together to uh, understand uh, Green's function learning, and in particular this result. Uh, since, since this result, there is a, a version that's a little stronger than what I'm going to say, but when you've, after you've discretized. So I'm going to be thinking about this as the solution operator, and this paper has kind of gone back to the, uh, the first slide that I had and di already discretized it and then learned the discretized Green's function. It's uh, slightly, slightly, slightly easier on some aspects and slightly more annoying in others. And the differences you'll see between those two will be related to the discretize and optimize and optimize and discretize sets of yeah, issues. It's very, yeah, it's very so. Uh, yeah, exactly. It's very close to discretize <laughs> and then provide theory for the matrices, or don't discretize and do functional continuous functional approximation stuff, uh, and then you discretize that. So there's small differences. The one big gap is that we know that we're learning the continuous Green's function, and it is really the true thing that you want to get in terms of the solution operator. Whereas here, uh, controlling exactly the discretization error that you make is another step that would need to be done. Yep, so I mean that they're related and uh, slightly different techniques, which is also interesting. But, <clears throat> okay. Um, so for the, for the second part of this talk, I'm going to be describing these uh, theoretical aspects of learning this Green's function. In particular, I'm going to uh, devise a continuous analog of the randomized uh, singular value decomposition, which will be a way that I'm going to learn parts of this Green's function. And I'm going to couple that together with knowledge, classical knowledge of regularity of Green's functions to come up with the, the learning rate for Green's functions. Okay, so just to recap on the randomized SVD. So this is kind of, this is a very discrete analog of what we're trying to do. We, 
let's suppose you have a matrix, but you don't know what the matrix is, and you would like to learn it. And you would like to learn it from vector in vectors that you can throw in to a black box. So you get to propose Vs. These are almost like forcing terms of your PDE. And you get to witness uh, X times V, the output from this matrix vector product. So that's like the solution of the PDE. And from that, you want to recover the best you can X, the, the matrix X. And uh, we know how to do this. This is a randomized SPD, uh, popularized in 2011. But of course, it goes back further. Um, the main contribution of this paper is uh, theoretical in nature and spoke to the numerical linear algebra community. So one way to do this is to set up a tall skinny matrix where you have, um, K, let's say, K plus five Gaussian random vectors, and you plug them in to your matrix vector product, and you get to witness the K plus five outputs, Z. From this, you can do uh, find out the orthogonal, orthogonal basis for that column space, that subspace that you found. And you can uh, form uh, a low rank approximation to, a, to, to x, which I call ak here. <clears throat> Sorry, this should be x and x. <clears throat> so using the randomized SVD, uh, which is just a way of, do, of proposing to use your matrix vector products, you can learn a, let's say learn a matrix uh, or it's close to its best rank k approximation uh, with high probability. And uh, it, it, here I'm just showing you that it matches the, the SVD, the truncated SVD. So this is kind of near optimal and uh, would allow you to learn a matrix just given its matrix vector product. <clears throat> now, uh, you can also do this not just with standard Gaussian vectors, but many types of vectors. And usually people assume IID random vectors, but you can also do it for correlated, in particular correlated Gaussian vectors where every, entries have some correlation. And uh, we, we went through the randomized SVD proof and uh, redid it with the assumption that the vectors are, have correlations. And you get basically the same result. There's a gamma k here, which is uh, a measure of how correlated the um, entries are. Of course, if you correlate them too much, then um, you don't learn as much as if they are standard Gaussians. And then this is kind of the measure of how correlated the, how the quality of your training data is, essentially. Um, I mean, this, this can be used in uh, some settings to actually improve on the randomized SVD, in particular in PDEs, where if you know something about the PDE, like its asymptotics, asymptotic eigenvalue de, uh, eigen, of its eigenvalues, then you can bias the inputs uh, in a way that actually improves the learning rate of the matrix if you have some prior knowledge about the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of your matrix. Okay, so anyway, this is a, just a, a generalization of the standard randomized SPD to correlated random vectors. And of course, Green's functions have singular values too, especially the ones with one, one to 3D elliptic PDEs. Um, this, is, this goes back actually before the, the SPD, <laughs> Smith in 1907, uh, wrote down the, the SVD for functions <clears throat> and proved its convergence and then uh, proved the ERCAC and Young theory of like all, all the theorems that we know for the SVD originate in literature for functions originally. But it means that uh, everything I was saying there about randomized SVD does have some continuous analog for functions where instead of you have a, instead of a matrix, you have a Green's function. And instead of random vectors, we're going to have random functions. And instead of a matrix vector product, you have a function operator product, uh, an in, uh, integral, uh, integral operator to impose. Now, most functions out there in the world, in terms of most Green's functions, they will be uh, of infinite uh, rank in the sense that they have an infinite number of non-zero singular values. However, the hope is, at least for smooth functions, it's known that those singular values decay very rapidly. And so you can truncate that uh, sequence and design a, a randomized SVD-like algorithm to learn green, uh, func smooth functions very efficiently. 
Okay, <clears throat> so this is what it looks like for when you try to do a randomized SVD for integral operators. Okay, so again, okay, I'm assuming self a joint here, but we plug in a function f, we do the integral operator product. That's replacing our matrix vector product. Instead of a tall skinny matrix filled with Gaussians, um, there is a continuous analog of multivariable Gaussian vectors where there's correlation between the entries, and that's known as a Gaussian process. So I'm going to feed in to this uh, operator product a bunch of functions that are drawn from a continuous analog of a multivariable Gaussian known as a Gaussian process. So I'm going to feed these in. So depending on this kernel C, it's going to change what these functions look like. Right? Some Cs, you might have a lot of correlation between the entries of your function and the functions be very smooth, or you could change your kernel so they get a bit more jagged, or you could have them uh, getting closer to being uh, like this, this. With this C, I can control the, the inputs that I'm doing right? and how much variation I'm allowing in my functions that I'm plugging in. Uh, of course, that this C has to, this can't be like close to standard Gaussian because these functions have to be continuous or at least um, so that we can make sense of this integral here. And so I'm going to then, you know, apply my integral operator and witness the output. I'm then going to do a QR, which is a continuous analog of a QR, where you do Gram-Schmidt on functions to uh, project or find an orthonormal basis for my output space in the same way that we did it for matrices. And using that, you can uh, devise a randomized SVD that learns the kernel of an integral operator. In the same way uh, that we had before, there's now a, a number here which controls the quality of the inputs, the training data, essentially, and that's based on this kernel C, right? If C is generating very smooth functions, then gamma K will be very small and you, this, this error will be much larger. Or if, if C is uh, getting you more wiggly functions, then this gamma K will uh, increase and uh, will improve your accuracy at the end. The issue is, uh, when you go and look at Green's functions, is they typically don't have rapidly decaying singular values. So this EK, which is the best rank K approximation to G, this EK, doesn't decay very fast with K, which means if I went for a single uh, snapshot of trying to get the whole Green's function at one go using the random SVD, I would need lots and lots of input output solutions, functions, pairs to learn G to within, a, within a, any accuracy using this method. So G is not globally of low rank. So as a, you can't apply this kind of thinking globally. Only if the function G was smooth would you be uh, good. And Green's functions typically are not smooth. Okay. So uh, this is just to indicate that we, we do know exactly when singular values decay and when to expect them to decay and when not. Here I've just put them in the 2D case. So the Green's function corresponds to a 1D PDE. Um, for example, if the Green's function is smooth in any kind of sense, like uh, a couple of times differentiable or analytic in some region when you look at a slice, then the Green's functions, the singular values decay algebraically or exponentially, respectively. And uh, th this goes back to Reed in, in 1983. It's a really nice paper here. Uh, I mean, in particular, um, even if I sum up a bunch of rank one functions, these, these functions here, rank one, they can be written as functions of x times functions of y, corresponding to an outer product of two vectors. There's 300 of them, so this G here is mathematically of rank 300. It looks like this. But even so, right, based on this, ga on this uh, gamma parameter here, that the singular values decay. And in fact, in this case, they decay super geometrically. So and that, that's known because this, this function is entire. So <clears throat> we, we really know exactly when these singular values decay fast and when they don't. Alex, these statements are for elliptic or parabolic or hyperbolic or everything? Uh, the, these right now is just a general statement about functions. Unfortunately, Green's functions corresponding to elliptic PDEs are not 
analytic, they're not even differentiable. So this is telling us we can't apply our randomized SVD uh, to the whole G at the same time. So we need to look a little bit deeper at the regularity of Green's functions. Now, so because Green's functions look like this, right? And they look, it looks all good and smooth, except on that diagonal. That diagonal there, it's in 1D, the Green's functions are continuous, but they're not differentiable. And that causes the singular values to decay very, very slowly. So this means if I, if I look at these, I've I like partitioned up my Green's function into little tiny patches. If I'm away from the diagonal, like down over here, then this function over here is very smooth and its singular values decay really fast. So I can learn this block of the Green's function uh, very efficiently using the randomized SVD. But I can't learn these red blocks very efficiently because they're close to the diagonal and the Green's function is not particularly smooth there. And so this is known as a hierarchical decomposition of a Green's function. This is known as a Hodler matrix. And people have studied this since the early 1990s. And we use these for fast solvers for PDEs. But now I'm going to use it for, uh, green, for learning Green's functions. So the way this works is uh, it's for, this decomposition is formed hierarchically. So you, fur, like you have multiple levels to this hierarchy. You first subdivide the Green's function up into a bunch of patches. Anything green here, which is far away from the diagonal, you go and learn using your randomized SVD, which you can do very efficiently. Then you gray out those regions because you've already learned them. And then you subdivide again. Anything in green, you go learn. And uh, you go to the next level with these red blocks and you subdivide again and learn the green blocks uh, very efficiently because the green function on that domain is very smooth. As you can see, as you subdivide in, uh, you know, you always got this red region that you can't learn efficiently with your randomized SVD. Uh, the same, by the way, this is in 1D, all the pictures, but the same works in 3D, though the pictures are very hard to think about. And so uh, here, uh, I'm trying to draw a 3D situation where you have well-separated box, block, blocks. So like the green and the blue are well-separated. So if you wrote that, if you had thought about that in terms of your greens functions, the greens function evaluated on this X space and this Y space would have low rank, uh, low, low singular, singular values decay. Whereas this red and this blue region together, if you tried to do that cross, they, it wouldn't be uh, low rank. And so everything I'm saying works in one, two, and three dimensions here, uh, except it, it's not so easy to draw pictures in, in two or three. And so, okay, these, these matrices have used, been used everywhere for greens functions before. And so that, this is kind of our algorithm. We're going to learn these green blocks at every level using the randomized SVD and wait till the next level to hopefully learn these red blocks. Okay, so this is what we're doing. And of course, this, uh, this approach never finishes because there's always red blocks left that you can't learn efficiently with the randomized SVD because their singular values don't decay. However, we know that while the Green's function becomes not very smooth on the diagonal, its significance to the overall integral, vector, integral function product uh, becomes more negligible as you go down in the levels. So we can do this process up to a certain level when we decide that the stuff that's left on the diagonal is negligible and can be, we set our approximation to G to be zero. By doing that, we perturb the two norm of our learned Green's function by at most epsilon. And this is coming from the fact that we, we uh, have control over what the size of the Green's function is on the diagonal. So we do this process learning parts of the Green's function until we get to a level where we know we can forget everything else. And we set our approximate to zero there. And uh, overall, we have a good approximation to our Green's function. Of course, if you discretize, you don't need to do this last step here. Okay, so when we're learning, when we're learning Green's functions, I have a method. Uh, we're, we're learning the we're learning a low rank approximation to the Green's function on every one of these Green subdomains. We, we, we learn functions in X 
times functions in y and the sum of them. That's what a low rank function is. Yeah, so what are the coefficients to? What are the coefficients to? I mean, if you want to do that in, in practice, then you would represent those 1D functions, let's say, using a Chebyshev expansion. And you would learn the coefficients of that Chebyshev expansion. Got it. Thanks. Yeah, so you, you could do it that way in practice. I'm, and I, 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 we have uh, in Chebfun, uh, which is a MATLAB package to work with low rank functions. That's exactly what we do. So. <clears throat> Yeah, here, here I'm kind of describing it at the continuous level. So I haven't got deep into how to actually discretize this to make it a practical scheme yet. <clears throat> so this is how you put this to get, this is how you can put those stuff together to get a learning rate. So you go away and you, you calculate what the singular value decay is on each of those green regions, how many levels you have to go down before you can forget, before you can just stop the process. And you kind of go around adding up how many inputs and outputs you needed across all of those domains. And in three dimensions, uh, this is the result you get. Um, I should have said it's in th this one's in three dimensions that I wrote down. In, in one dimension, it will be epsilon minus two here. In, in two dimensions, it will be epsilon minus four here. Uh, this, this, gamma, this uh, gamma eta here is a measure of how of the covariance kernel that you use in your Gaussian process. So how smooth you were inputting functions, which is controlling your quality of input and output pairs. So based on the quality, right? If, you, if the quality is poor, then you need more input output pairs to be able to learn it. And in addition, there might be a, a level that you can't get below. For example, if I only plug in functions that only have a few Fourier modes associated to them, then I can't learn the Green's function below a certain frequency in some sense. There's a plateau there. And this, is, this is why it also appears inside the error that you obtain. Right? High quality functions get you both a smaller input output pair, as well as you can get uh, a smaller error overall. Okay, so uh, I was going to just mention uh, uh, briefly uh, exactly what the quality of that training data is. Uh, we know it precisely. It's, there's, a, there's a particular measure that we have. And it, it pretty much says the following, that if you give me functions that are not very smooth, then I like it. I, li I like very wiggly functions because I get to learn both the low and the high frequency components of G on each subdomain. And I really, really like it if your covariance kernel uh, lines up with the singular vectors that G has. So this is where this is coming here. This is a Rayleigh quotient, a continuous Rayleigh quotient here. It's saying, you know, the best case scenario is that C, the kernel generates very wiggly functions in a way that aligns with the singular vectors of G itself. Of course, in practice, you can never design the optimal C because you don't know the singular vectors of G before you learn it. And so uh, this is just a, a kind of a, a posteriori uh, way of measuring the quality of your training data after the fact. <clears throat> okay. So uh, maybe I should pause here for, t for a minute and just see if there are any questions. Hey. Alex, I have a question. Can you go back to the previous slide, please? Uh, so is it possible to, as we are doing this forcing and observing the response in a sequential way, uh, we get a better sense for the singular vectors of G, go back and update K because, yes. right? So we don't have to set the K T equals yep. zero and then right, we can update that also and Absolutely. then improve that, right? Yep, we haven't analyzed that, and I don't know how exactly how much you would gain from doing that, but yeah, in principle, you can do that, of course, yeah. But uh, yeah, here we just have a single, we choose our covariance kernel and we go for it. So ideally, the best uh, GP is not the one that is like white noise, uh, yeah. is the one that has the structure of the G mm -hmm. that we want to approximate, right? Exactly. So if you knew G, then you could design the optimal training data for it. That's right. So, Where, uh, but of course, you don't know G, so it's a right. chicken and egg problem. Yeah. I, I suspect the analog of that is also for randomized linear algebra. So you hit, yeah. you don't hit it with IID, you hit it with mm -hmm. 
singular vectors. Colored, colored, yeah, and then they're associated with their singular vectors. Right. So you could you could learn the best rank k approximation to a if I knew the singular vectors ahead of time. I plug in the singular vectors yep, exactly. Plug yep. it to a, and I and I get everything perfect. That's right. Yep. So this is this is the analog of this here. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. So uh, in part three here, I'm going to be looking now at uh, Green learning Green's functions actually in practice a bit more. So we, we have this theoretical method, we know it works. Uh, we, we yet to get into deep learning. <laughs> so I'm going to uh, do this now. Because these deep learning methods are spectral in the sense, in the same sense as before, that uh, they really are as a fit, more efficient than that theoretical algorithm that I devised there, in terms of the number of training uh, inputs and outputs that you need to reach a certain accuracy. So motivated by that theory, though, we're going to we're going to have a deep learning framework that, that learns these Green's functions. So we, we design our covariance kernel of our GP. It generates forcing terms, these random GP, these functions that get realized as um, from uh, this covariance kernel. These are creating random functions. We plug them into, uh, well, we, we observe, we get to observe these are the forcing terms. We get to observe the response. And we take this training data from B and C into, uh, and we try to train a neural net. Okay, we, we separate out the homogeneous part, the bit that takes care of the boundary conditions, as well as the bit that takes care of the solution operator with it, without boundary conditions here, or with zero boundary conditions, uh, to make these guys more interpretable. And so if I actually tried this with Poisson, we end up learning uh, some homogeneous solution as well as the Poisson Green's function that, that we know. And so, <clears throat> okay. Now, obviously, as I've been saying, Green's functions are actually quite nasty. They're nasty functions because, uh, okay, in 1D, they don't look too bad. They're continuous, but don't have a derivative across the diagonal. In 2D, they have a logarithmic singularity, often. Well, for 2D elliptic PDEs with bounded coefficients, they're not even bounded on the diagonal, <laughs> so that they are unbounded. Um, <clears throat> and it, gets, it only gets worse from there. So in, in 3D, they're not just logarithmic glow up but there's like a one over R blow up on the diagonal. So these Green's functions, though they correspond to a nice Hilbert Smith operator as a whole, the actual functions themselves are very nasty, logarithmic or one over R blow up. This means that if I try to learn the Green's function with a ReLU, like a standard ReLU neural network, I, I end up in trouble because the uh, ReLU piecewise linear <laughs> is not particularly useful, not particularly uh, ideal for learning uh, these kind of blow-ups. So instead of, instead of uh, I mean, I've got this neural net that I'm going to try to learn for a Green's function. And because ReLU, if I just try a ramp function inside my neural network, because that generates a piecewise linear map, that's tricky for Green's functions because of these blow-ups that they have on the diagonal. And so we needed to devise a new neural network to be able to learn these Green's functions. And uh, just to remind you, I mean, neural networks go way back, right? I mean, in terms of classical thinking in approximation theory, they were known as composite function approximation. Like Horner's method is a composite, composite way of writing down a polynomial, which is very good for evaluating it. Um, we, have comp we have a whole field of composite polynomials, composite rationals, and uh, like splines and all kinds of different composite rules. Uh, it was very big in approximation theory all the way back from the 1920s. And uh, we went back to this kind of original literature to see if we could find a neural network that was efficient at learning functions that blow up on the diagonal. In particular, um, rationals are extremely good at doing that. So rationals are functions that are polynomial divided by another polynomial. Here, here I've taken a, a particular example, which is the sine function. So it's minus one on some domain and one on another, just to illustrate the point that classically, you might be able to, you would write down a rational fit to this sine function. And this has nothing to do with neural nets, right? Just a rational fit. Uh, this might be the best, uh, right, a best rational fit. You might be able to see that from equi-oscillation principle, classic approximation theory. But in 1962, Basically, someone worked out that Lebedev uh, worked out that this rational fit here is actually in some sense a neural net. 
Okay, it's a neural net with only width one. There's just there's width one and depth k, uh, the number of compositions you have to do. But nevertheless, it, it is kind of a strange neural network where the activation function is rational and the linear parts are completely gone. There's no linear parts to this rational function, to this uh, neural net. Um, but in today's modern language, we would say that's a rational function, rational neural net with depth k, width one. And uh, because uh, ReLU is just kind of the average between apps of x and x, we know that rash, this kind of rational neural network here will be excellent at approximating ReLU. Even in particular, we, we, we wrote down that rational neural networks have a much better approximation power than ReLU neural networks. Because anything that ReLU can do, rationals can do, because re, rationals can approximate ReLU, but they can do some things better, like blow up functions. <clears throat> so um, we have, uh, we have, we've devised these rational neural networks that are really good for blow up functions. In particular, in some sense, they put their poles, because rationals are polynomial divided by polynomial, and the poles are the zeros of the denominator. They cluster their poles uh near singularities of the greens function in the end they're going to just cluster their poles okay here here are some theoretical results showing you that they have better approximation power you can read these like if you give me a relu neural network and epsilon is 10 to the minus 3 that's my accuracy i want then i can devise a rational neural network which is log log 10 to the 3 uh bigger in terms of its number of parameters so if you give me a ReLU neural network with 100 parameters, epsilon is 10 to the minus 3, log log of that is uh, about 2. So it says I can build a rational neural network with twice as many parameters that can approximate that ReLU network. And uh, <clears throat> vice versa. But alternatively, if I give you a rational neural network and ask you to approximate it by ReLU, you're going to have a much tougher time because of uh, instead of log log, you have log here so it's, it's you have to blow up the degrees of freedom you have to have a much bigger ReLU neural network to approximate a rational one and this is in some sense uh obvious to the approximation theorists that piecewise linear functions okay they're great at approximating piecewise linear functions but quite poor at approximating polynomials in some sense whereas smooth activation functions like polynomials are great for smooth functions but not so great for piecewise linear. Whereas rationals are this thing that we use in approximation theory that strad to straddle both sides, that get smooth things very good because they can, they can collapse the polynomials, but they also get non-smooth things well by clustering their poles in the complex plane. So <clears throat> this is what these rational neural networks are, are doing. And, and so, okay, people are, uh, yep. Okay. So in particular, Alex, you're going to scale well. You, you can have a trillion poles yeah. because the log log, you'll need a factor of 10 or something, but you can have a trillion poles. And I say trillion, that's the number of data points. If you have a singularity at each data point, you can handle that right. by the, okay, good. Right, right. We can just cluster these poles. And there's so many poles that we can cluster them. Uh, and the, the clustering of the poles also tells you the singularity type, by the way. So anyway, the, the rationals, or at least the trained neural networks will train their poles to try to do this. So this looks a lot like a matern kernel with very non-RBF yeah. parameters. You have singularities on the data points, which are yeah. models for this interpolating yeah. machine. Yeah, this, yeah. This, this, this isn't exactly related to uh, radial basis functions on the kernel-based learning, because rationals don't quite have that theory, but it's very similar. Yeah. It but those, it looks like matern, where you have the singularity for whatever the small yeah. values of that data parameter are. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. totally agree. So, um, so I mean, we see this, this is just in 1D, I just showed you so I could show you some pictures, because uh, in 2 and 3D it's hard to show pictures, that with the same neural network size, the same amount of training and everything, we, we, we're getting better accurate. And this is in 1D, the situation gets far, far worse in uh, more dimensions. And that's why we came up with it, because we couldn't train 2D for 2D problems using ReLU, because of the blow-ups that we usually see, the logarithmic blow-ups. So, so back to our framework, instead of just taking a normal kind of 
normal uh, neural net here, we're going to just replace, in fact, we replace both of them <laughs> by a rational neural network. But really, this Green's function one is the important one to replace by a rational neural network. If you want to have a neural network of modest size that approximates the Green's function well. <clears throat> and so, so now I have, uh, just uh, to finish off, I just have uh, some examples uh, to show you this in practice. So here I've got Schrodinger's equation. I put a double well into the potential. And so uh, what I, of course, I, I don't get to see this PDE. All I get to do is query it and so have a solver for it. So here's the potential. You can see the double well potential. And uh, this is the Green's function that we learned associated to this uh, PDE. So we, we get to see this from the output of our method. You can see that there's a double well by the way it's there's two the clumps of concentration of the Green's function. Now, Green's functions, their eigenfunctions, are the same as the eigenfunctions of the PDE operator. That they have the same eigenfunctions. So in particular, one of the things that people like to do with Schrodinger's equation is to plot these uh, potential well plots where you plot the eigenfunctions, you, you, you change their scale of the eigenfunctions based on the eigenvalues, and uh, this is the plot that we, so we, we got to, from training data input output, we, we were able to reproduce these learning eigenstates, these learn eigenstates that uh, often is a plot that people like to do with Schrodinger's equation. So not only are the eigenvectors, eigenfunctions the same between the Green's function and the partial differential equation, but the eigenvalues are reciprocals of each other. So from this Green's function, we can give back the eigen modes and eigenvalues of the differential operator up to you know some accuracy. <clears throat> um, the the rational neural networks also have some other benefits. For example, you get to see the location of singularities that might be forming, and we're hoping that this might be uh, ideal later for hyperbolic PDEs, where you really want to find out where shocks happen. Because uh, here I've set, we've set up a, uh, a vection diffusion uh, equation where we've deliberately made one of the coefficients uh, discontinuous. And so we learn a Green's function. This is the learned Green's function. You can, see, you can kind of see that something happened at x equals 0. Because below, when x is negative, this ends up just being the 1D uh, Laplacian. And you get the Poisson kernel associated to that. But over here in this regime, it looks more like an evection problem, and you're, you're seeing that here. Right? You can see it's evection because it's zero over this side and positive over here, saying that information is traveling in one direction from uh, left to right or right to left in this domain. Um, from the rational neural network for the homogeneous solution here, we can, that's a rational, there's a rash, that's a rational function, the rational neural network that we've trained. We can go and plot that rational neural network in the complex plane and observe its poles. Now, if you, if you uh, know your complex analysis and you, look, you like looking at these pictures, uh, these pictures are rainbow plots, phase portrait plots, that show you, if you're kind of, let's say, trained a little bit, exactly where the poles are. So every time there's a rainbow around a single um, dot here, going in the clockwise direction, it corresponds to a pole of the rational function. And so you can see here, there's a bunch of poles in the complex plane. Most of them just out here are just kind of spurious. They're just out here. But as they get close to x equals 0, they're clustering on x equals 0. So it's very hard from this function to see exactly uh, where that's, if there's a singularity or not. But from looking at the poles and watching them cluster onto the real line, over here, we can see that there is a discontinuity in, in the coefficients here. We get to witness that with these poles. Even though the homogeneous solution looks perfectly smooth, you can witness its, uh, its non-smooth behavior by looking into the complex plane. Uh, this also applies to 2D and 3D problems, uh, systems as well. So here I just gave you a, give you a system so here we have a Stokes flow problem and a lid driven cavity. This is a standard kind of CFD test case benchmark problem. You have a fluid in a, in a box and uh, 
the three sides, the, the bottom and the two walls of the drum, are no slip boundary conditions. So that the fluid is uh, stationary at the boundary. But on the top edge over here, it's being sheared to the, to the right uh, with velocity one in this case. Uh, we have some constraints that we would like to like want to impose on the that's are is it are imposed on the solution like uh, incompressibility divergence of u is zero as well as uh, you know the st standard stokes equation here and um right because this is a system there's not a single greens function that maps you from forcing term to solution there's really four right there's there's four there's the first component of f how it modifies the first component of u which we're calling G11, the second component of F, and how it modifies the first component of U, G12, and so on. The first component modifying the second, second component modifying the second for the solution. And so here, okay, these are 4D functions now because I'm in 2D, but I've taken slices just to show you what it's like. And so this is the kernel that takes you from the function, the first component of the forcing term to the first component of the solution at 0.5.5. And so you're kind of seeing that kernel of interaction there. Anyway, in the end, we, from just data, we can, we can like learn this velocity field. We can learn all these uh, response kernels uh, as well. OK, so, so once you've learned a Green's function, <laughs> you would like to be able to uncover some things about the PDE itself. And so here I've just got a slide of what we can currently do. So if the Green's function is symmetric, that is an indication that the PDE operator is self-adjoint. And so you can see self-adjointness from the symmetries in G. If there's a linear conservation law like divergence free, you also get to witness that on the Green's function. The eigenvalues and their decay the, they have the same eigenvalues as the PD operator, so you can see that. Uh, singularity detection can also reveal things about singularities and the variable coefficients, even though we don't recover them, the variable coefficients of the PDE. As well as uh, the eigenfunctions of the Green's function correspond to eigenfunctions of the PDEO itself, the, PD, the partial differential equation itself. And so there are some features that you can extract from these Green's functions that tell you things about the underlying PDE model itself, as well as just being a solution operator that gives you a fast way to solve a PDE given a new right-hand side. Okay, so um, just to summarize, I showed you that, I, I showed you a rather theoretical algorithm that learns Green's functions using some randomized SVD techniques and the underlying classical mathematics of hierarchical matrices and uh, Green's functions, and uh, also showed you a more practical way of, of solving for these Green's functions, which gives, gives the same learning rate in practice as uh, what we uh, observe for Green's functions. And if you want to try that out, we, it's, very, it's very simple to code up rational neural networks. It's five lines in TensorFlow, as well as a package that allows you to learn Green's functions. So anyway, I'll stop there, and thank you for listening. <laughs> All right, this is great, Alex. I wish we had another hour. I'd pepper you with questions. So maybe I'll sync up with you later and, and see if there's any other questions here. Alex, uh, very interesting talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I um, have a question for you. So uh, if, the if the Green's function doesn't have a low rank structure, it's, yeah. it's very high rank. So uh, if we add more forcing, uh, and learn that like one could do forcing for every grid point, which means that we are actually trying poking the system yeah. in every direction. So then, then we have a full matrix. I know that's not efficient, but the, the, the question is that, okay, we want to reduce the number of samples we have, right? Number of times we poke this and efficiently learn that. I wonder how much using the neural network improve in terms of like providing less data in terms of in comparison to just randomized SVD in, in learning G. Well, both, both get a log one over, you need like log one over epsilon. 
um, okay. for, the, for the greens for the for the theoretical algorithm in practice the constants are are really high uh the constants are huge so um i mean the theory doesn't care about constants but in practice you do um whereas the neural net approach has for some reason which we don't understand exactly why it's giving the same learning rate that we have for the theoretical algorithm but the constants are also really good okay. so that's why we went to a deep learning approach because the constants are great the constants good so so that way you can basically learn with the same level of accuracy with less data with less observations in, in using yeah the deep right. learning compared to the we still we still feeding training data that comes from a gaussian process that's right because we observe that those are very good test testing functions because they kind of probe the system randomly across all you know so it's they're really good uh, that's me. Um, but the for some reason the neural net process is like almost in our minds like learning the hierarchical structure of this greens function as well which we don't fully understand that's right no very interesting thank you yeah. uh is there any luck learning greens function for 1d wave equations um <clears throat> right so one thing i needed here was that the greens function uh is square integrable um, and that holds for 1, 2, and 3D elliptic and 1D parabolic, but doesn't hold, for example, 2D para parabolic or hyperbolic, like a, with a, like a wave equation. So um, the jury is still out on terms of PDE learning for those equations. Um, so I guess uh, we, haven't, we haven't fully tried, but um, it would be interesting to know what happens for a 1D wave equation. I'm imagining not much good right now. <laughs> So the, if I recall correctly, the greens function is specific to a given domain. Yeah. Um, have you thought about how to generalize this to learning features of the operator given like different domains? Yeah, this is why we, we split out the homogeneous, we have a homogeneous network learning the boundary conditions and the greens function learning the operator to try to get some more interpretability into the greens function that we were learning. So if you go, if we go back to the uh, setup here, I, ha I have a, I have a neural network that's learning this, this thing that's taking into, trying to take into account the homogeneous solution. And then I have a greens function here that's trying to take into account the forcing of the right hand side with zero boundary conditions. And so when we, when we try this, when we actually do this in practice, we learn this homogeneous neural network first by plugging in, well, just by by asking, you know, give me back the solution for the zero function. And then you can, you get to learn this and then training this by plugging in these excitations. So we're, we're already trying our best to split out the impact of the boundary conditions on the greens function. I don't know if there's a, there's a better way of doing it, but uh, this was our, our first attempt at doing that. Have, have you used an alternating approach? What, is, what does that mean? You learn this and then that and then this. Yeah, thing. yeah, exactly. Uh, we don't currently do that, but of yeah. course you can play these kind of games. Hello, Alex. I actually had a question for you on this slide. So you're learning your green function given some source and forcing uh, pairs with boundary conditions. Um, do you relearn your green function for a new boundary condition or do you have to train your network every time you change your boundary condition yeah yeah so this this one here the idea is that it doesn't it doesn't get impacted by the boundary condition oh so once you learn the green function, function. yeah oh. so once you learn the green function you could plug a new boundary condition and, and solve it for the new boundary yeah. condition exactly so the the idea is that this splits up the impact of the boundary conditions which is all here and the operator which is all here Oh, great. Um, I believe if the type of the boundary condition changed, it wouldn't affect it, right? If the type changed, uh, then then uh, I believe it does actually. It might, it, yeah, it might change this. Uh, it will change this Green's function. The type, like if I if I have yeah. different types of Dirichlet conditions, then this would be fine. But if I change from Dirichlet yeah. to Neumann, then that would be, uh, uh, yeah, that would and, change. Uh, I believe you trained uh, these networks with some gradient descent type optimizers, yeah. right? Yeah, we use uh, Adam's method for a bit and then uh, LBFGS. 
Oh, cool. I, I couldn't actually see the connection between uh, randomized SVD and and deep learning of green function. If you're using oh. atom optimizers, so like, what is the connection between the two? So there's there's no connection in terms of the algorithm, except that it motivates our choice of training data. Uh, however, it, it gives us a theoretical way of saying that this approach, even though it's not quite this algorithm, there is an algorithm out there, which is the one I described, which has a learning rate, which is basically spectral, log one of epsilon. So uh, while this is also a spectral, a spectral method in terms of the number of input output training data that you need, um, we just don't have theory for why this one is working so well, but we do have a theoretical algorithm that does get us a spectral learning rate. So it was really just adding theoretical weight to uh, the, the way that we're learning these Green's functions with neural nets. Nice. I, I guess I have another question, but I don't want to take too much of your time. It's uh, related to the shock capturing that you said that um, yeah. this way of learning Green function could probably help in capturing shock. Yeah. Yeah. So um, from what I understand, Green functions are for linear operators, but shocks usually they're non-linear so yeah. how, how do you think this could help in that yes. regard so we we already in our in our paper we already actually do non-linear but i didn't want to confuse the issue but if you can uh, let's say you if you have a semi semi-linear pde where you can split up the linear and the non-linear term and you have a time stepper then we are able to learn the linear a linear propagator and from that we were hoping to be able to see shocks coming by watching these poles in the complex plane, slowly getting closer and closer to the real line. And at some point, you know, saying, okay, there's a shock about to happen, even oh, though nice. we haven't got that, right? We're just watching them in the complex plane, approaching the real line. And we know if they touch the real line, there's a shock and it's gonna be a shock. So we're, nice. we're, 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 we're watch, that's the idea. We're watching these ones cluster. The type of clustering in the complex plane by the way, tells you the, the type of singularity that you're expecting. So if they exponentially cluster to the real line, that means something, I forget exactly what it is. And if they algebraically cluster, that means something else. Great, thank you. I have another question for you, Alex. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, the, the way we, you measure the accuracy is that how good you approximate the Green's function, but ultimately one is interested how good we approximate you under yeah. the new forcing, mm -hmm. right? That might be a simpler task to do because a lot of this irregularity in the Green's function may not matter in the output of you. I can see if you force this system uh, that uh, it, it's like a smooth function, probably a lot of this, you know, uh, uh, singularities or near singularity behavior may not matter even. Why are we even trying to learn mm -hmm. something that ultimately so I think it depends what you want. If you just want a solution operator that works for low frequency right hand sides, then, then that's a much way. easier task, as you were saying. That's right. And if I want to understand the Green's function of the PDE, which is what I was going for, that's which means right. I can accept, you know, I don't have to have any assumptions of what's coming in on the right hand side. Um, so it depends what you want, first of all. A lot of the uh, Fourier neural operator, for example, when they measure the accuracy of their Fourier neural operator, they take very smooth right-hand sides. And so um, for okay. them, there's, the accuracy is, is being measured against some predefined notion of what the right-hand sides will look like. Absolutely. Whereas here, I'm really measuring the accuracy based on the, like, it can be That's very the worst case, worst case right -hand side. Right. It, and still learning. showing, still showing that there's a spectral learning rate. Mm -hmm. so in some sense, it's uh, stronger. Mm -hmm. Regard. Very interesting. Uh, yeah, I agree. It really depends on what you want. If you tell me a priori exactly what frequency you want, then you could divide. You can devise the algorithm to, to learn just a, a subclass of solutions, right? right? And then you can be a lot more efficient. Yeah. Right. Particularly if the singular values of the Green's function also are frequent ordered by frequency, then it becomes that becomes very simple. That's right. Mm -hmm. very interesting. Thanks. Yeah. Good question. Okay, if there are no further questions, Alex, let me thank you again for this great talk. Um, and I hope we can have you back in fall to tell us a bit more about uh, Koopman operators. I'm very excited to hear right. about that as well, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, thank you for having me.
Uh, Thank you so much, uh, Alex. I really enjoyed that. Together, so I appreciate the online seminar. Of course. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks.